Shut up and sit down. Well, hey, everybody. My name is Paul Abernathy, and I am your host for this episode where we talk about the National Electrical Code, and more specifically today, we're going to talk about grounding and bonding. Now, most people are aware we have a very extensive grounding and bonding course here at the Electrical Code Academy, and you can purchase that course from our website at mastertheNEC.com.net or .org or electricalcodeacademy.com net.com or .org as well. And in this course, we learn on a whole lot of important information about grounding and bonding and the understanding of the differences in grounding and bonding. But what we wanted to do today is kind of go over one of the units and give you kind of an overview of what's to expect in one of our grounding and bonding courses. Now, I'm also a co-author of this document, that the book from Cengage. And so I was very pleased to work on it with a really good friend of mine, Phil Simmons. And so um, we both serve on Code Making Panel 5, so we have this intimate knowledge of grounding and bonding that we like to share. And so that's what I'm going to do in this course. Again, there's a lot of questions and unit exams and things like that. You can always ask me any question at any point during your, the program that you have a confusion or need clarification when it comes to grounding and bonding. That's the whole point of the program is to expand your knowledge of grounding and bonding. So we're kind of going to go and look and see. So in our course... Uh, this is an example or kind of an overview of what you would see for unit three. Uh, and in this case, we're talking grounding electrode system and grounding electrode conductors. Now, the one thing about our course uh, that is unique is that it is actually systematically moves you through the actual different sections uh, of Article 250, whereas some books will kind of throw you all over the place. Uh, this one moves you through successively all the way through. So you start out back at 250.4, 250.6, objectionable currents, and, and you work your way on up till you get to tables like 251.22, 251.02C1, all the way up. So you kind of move yourself through it. Obviously, Unit 3 is dealing with the grounding electrode system in 250.50, as well as 250.52 and all those things that go along with grounding electrode systems and the grounding electrode conductors, okay? So it's kind of an overview of what you could learn in this course, but I kind of wanted to give you an idea, a sample, because I get a lot of people who really want to know more about grounding and bonding. So that's kind of what the course is all about. And again, they're all available on our website at electrocodeacademy.com, .net, or .org, really doesn't matter, or master the NEC. Dot com, dot net or dot org, and you go up to courses and you'll find the grounding and bonding course. All right, so let's kind of work our way through it now. Now, after you work through this unit in our course, uh, you're going to be able to summarize the requirements for grounding electrode systems. You're going to fully understand the, the concept behind it and the necessity of a grounding electrode system. You're going to be able to explain the grounding electrodes required to be used and those not permitted to be used. Okay, so we're going to cover all of those details. Uh, you're going to be able to summarize the installation requirements for the grounding electrode system itself. And you'll be able to summarize the requirements for supplemental grounding electrodes, which is really important to be able to understand what a supplemental grounding electrode is. And it is different than the required electrode when you're dealing with the supplemental. Uh, you'll be able to explain the installation of auxiliary Grounding electrodes, which again is different than a supplemental, okay? Like water pipe grounds, if it qualifies, has to be supplemented, okay? But you might have a parking lot lamp that is in a pole lamp and that would be by an engineer might require an auxiliary grounding electrode. And you'll learn the difference between what supplementary is versus an auxiliary. An auxiliary is just optional. Do it if you want doesn't have to meet all the normal rules within the National Electrical Code under Article 250, but you will get guidance from the engineer who's specifying that you use an auxiliary grounding electrode. Uh, summarize the resistance requirements for rod, pipe, and plate type of electrodes. Summarize the requirements for the use of the common grounding electrode and how you would size that and, and what we mean by common grounding electrode. You'll be able to summarize the installation requirements for grounding electroconductors in their entirety, whether it's going to a concrete encased electrode 
uh, again, rod, pipe, or plates, or whether it's a ground ring, or whether it's going in ground system, all of those will be summarized and you'll be able to understand it by the end of the course. Of course, you'll be able to recall the minimum size for the grounding electrode conductors, and you'll be able to explain the methods for connecting grounding and bonding conductors to grounding electrodes. Of course, all these terminations have to be in accordance with 250.8, and we'll cover all that in the program. And explain using building structural metal and water pipes as grounding electrode conductors. And we'll cover all of those ins and outs so that you fully understand them. Now, as I said earlier, the course is going to go in very deep descriptions of each thing when it comes to grounding electrode systems. Not just the electrode, but the system itself. Uh, as it says here in 250.50, all grounding electrodes that are described in 250.52A1 through A7, which is a, a list of all the different types of grounding electrodes, starting with water pipe ground and ending with other types of, of grounding electrodes. Um, you'll be able to learn each one of them, how you connect them, and the nuances between them, and that they all have to be tied together. Okay, uh, And if none of these electrodes exist, then one or more of the grounding electrodes in 250.52A4 through 8 are required to be installed and used. So the biggest difference is typically in 250.52A1, A2, and A3, typically these are things that are inherent to construction, whether it's concrete case electrodes that are designed in the footer, where the rebar is in the footer and it's contact with the earth, or it is a water pipe ground if it is applied to the building and it's 10 foot, 10 foot in contact with the earth. Um, I think you, all these things are inherently part of construction. However, it makes it real clear that if they are not present at all at the building, then you have to establish one. So at that point, you can utilize 250.52A4 through A8 as required if you don't have some of the ones that are kind of part of building construction. It's kind of inherent to the construction of the project. Okay, uh, There is an exception. Concrete and case electrodes of existing building structure are not required to be part of the grounding electro system if the steel reinforcing bars or rods are not accessible for use without disturbing the concrete. So if the building's existing, let's say you, you had the slab and you have the building and it's, and it's already been permitted out and now they're coming in, then again, if the use of a concrete case electrode for that building, you're not going to be required to chisel up to get down to that rebar. Okay. And in some cases, the jurisdiction might even require you to add additional electrodes. Okay. But here it just says the concrete case electrodes of existing buildings or structures are not required to be part of the grounding electrode system if the steel reinforcing bars or rods are not accessible for use without disturbing the concrete. So another big key here is if I go to a building, and we used to have this term, all of the electrodes that were available. Now we utilize a term called all that are present. And so this is a way of saying, you know what, if it was a concrete case electrode, it was down in the concrete, maybe it's a slab, they took a building, they removed it, they're building a new building on this slab, the concrete case electrode is already presently in place, and the only way that you can make a connection to it would be to chisel it up, and that thus would probably weaken the foundation. If that's the case, then you're going to act like it's not even there, and you're going to have to install a grounding electro system in accordance with 250.52. Okay, so one of the ones, and obviously you wouldn't install the concrete encased electrode one. So when we're talking about uh, systems here, you can see on the screen uh, A1 through A7, uh, and it's again pictured out in the numbers. Uh, what we see down here in number one, which is the metal underground water pipe right here, and that would be 10 foot in contact with the earth. Okay, and then you've got number two, which is going to be here, which is the in-ground support structure okay it can be encased in concrete or directly driven into the ground and here it is and it's basically the metal frame of the building driven down into the ground um, the third one is says concrete case electrode and that's right here so that's 20 feet of half inch rebar uh, in the footer uh, in contact with the earth or foundation and again it has to be at least 20 feet now, it doesn't mean it has to be 20 feet continuous. It can be 21 foot pieces that are connected together with normal tie wires. It cumulatively has to make up more than 20 feet. Uh, the other option of this would be a four gauge copper, 
which could be placed, and it has to be 20 feet as well, and that could be placed in the footer. Um, so that is option for a concrete encased electrode. Uh, number four deals with a ground ring. Now, this ground ring could go around the entire building, okay? So it has to encircle the building. Uh, and this does not have to be larger than a two gauge, uh, but can it be larger than a two? Absolutely. Okay, and there's some caveats to how, where it is in the daisy chain effect to, to determine whether or not you'd have to be a larger size. But typically, if you have a ground ring, it doesn't have to be larger than a two gauge. Um, and so that is one type of grounding electrode. Of course, you have five, which is probably the most common that we run into. Uh, that is a ground rod or pipe type of electrode, and that is driven in the ground, eight feet in contact with the earth. If you hit rock, you can do it at 45 degree angle. If you hit rock again, then you can dig it and put it in a trench. Okay, so we'll, we cover that in the program pretty deep uh, as well. Um, and then, of course, you have six, which is other listed grounding electrode. Here's an other listed one. This is one where you put certain chemicals in it and it saturates out into the earth, and it's basically uh, has a connection that gets made to it. And this is considered an other listed grounding electrode. And if it's listed under its listing for grounding uh, as a grounding electrode, then you can utilize it. It would fall under the other listed grounding electrode. And of course, the last one we have here is the plate. So the plate gets placed into the earth, uh, and that is a viable option as well. Certain amount of surface area, which we'll all cover in the program when you, you get into our grounding and bonding program. So you have all these options. They all have to be tied together. Uh, commonly, if you had a water pipe ground, the five foot point of entry uh, where it comes into the building up to five feet is the point where you could interconnect all these different electrodes to, to be able to do that. You cannot use rebar under the 2020 National Electrical Code as an interconnection point for other electrodes. Okay, so that was made very clear in the 2020 edition. So you have all these different types. Another interesting thing is in this case right here, a lot of people think that the grounding electroconductor to ground rods has to be continuous through it. And of course you supplement the ground rod with another electrode if it doesn't meet 25 ohms or less. In this case, it's supplemented with a, a plate just in this example. Um, but it doesn't have to run continuously all the way through. Uh, the grounding electroconductor theoretically stops right here, and this right here becomes a bonding jumper, okay? So all of these type of things get covered in our course, uh, and again, makes it really easy. So we're excited about the grounding and bonding course, and hopefully you will too. Uh, get really excited about it. Um, electrodes permitted for grounding. Use of the grounding electrodes in this section become mandatory rules due to the requirements in 250.50. Some electrodes are traditionally installed by other trades. I mean, like we said, they're usually there, possibly inherently in the construction. Electrodes A4 through A9 are often installed by electricians, whereas A1, A2, and A3 are generally there in ground steel, concrete encased electrode, or water pipe gets installed by somebody else. So as an electrician, you walk up onto the scene, you're like, hey, my job's already done. And of course, if it's a water pipe ground, then you've got to supplement it, obviously. But if it's a concrete encased electrode or it's in ground steel, you're like, I'm done. I don't have to do anything else. Now, sometimes people will put on plans to supplement those. They're not, you don't have to, but sometimes they will. Um, but again, those three are usually inherent to construction at some point. Whereas A4, A4 through 8 are typically ones that the electrician are going to have to install. If the others aren't present, then I would install one of these. Okay. So again, 250.52A1, talking about the metal underground water pipe. You've kind of heard me talk about it a little bit. We cover all this in our program. Um, required to be used if 10 foot or more in direct contact with the earth. If it's not 10 foot or more in contact with the earth, then it is not to be used as an electrode, period. The interior metal water piping located uh, more than five feet from the point of entrance and are not permitted to be used for connection purposes. So if I'm gonna connect other electrodes to this pipe, I got up to five feet that I can do so. I cannot go beyond that. Now there is an exception to that rule in commercial applications where it's unobstructed, then, then they have some allowances. But for the typical application, you gotta do the connection within the five feet. 
Again, just remember there is an exception. Of course, we'll talk about that in the program so that you have a better understanding. Uh, and then we'll cover each of these when we do occasional webinars as part of the program uh, that you'll be invited to. And you can ask any of those type of questions as well. Um, now, what about the 250.52A2 that we talked about? That is the in-ground uh, support structure. Literally, the, the, the metal framing is down into the earth, okay? So it's the method of making a connection to a metal frame of the building or structure as described. Requires direct contact with the earth or concrete encased, okay? Uh, once it's recognized, uh, once a recognized ground electrode, it can be used to bond other electrodes. So once it's determined that it has that contact with the earth, uh, it can then be used as a interconnection for other electrodes. I mean, there's a lot of surface area that's gonna be in contact with the earth. If a ground rod's okay, then you know this metal building, this support system in the ground, okay? This is different than the metal framing in the building, okay? It's part of the structure itself. This is an in-ground support. It's actually driven, it goes down into the ground. It is a structural support component for the building, okay? And this is an example right here. So here is your framing at this connection point. This is the framing of the building. This is the in-ground structural support. It can be in concrete encased or sometimes that even longer when they're driven without concrete. But that's that direct contact with the earth of 10 foot or more and with or without concrete encasing is what's going to give it that component that makes it a grounding electrode, okay? Um, now 250.52A3, concrete encased electrodes, as you see on the screen here, it required to be used where it's present. So it typically it is present in all installations uh, where you have a concrete footer or foundation that is in direct contact with the earth. If there's a layer of a vapor barrier that makes the foundation or the footer not in contact with direct earth, then it is not a concrete encased electrode. It has to be in direct contact, okay? So um, as you see here, it was required to be used where it's present in, present. in most construction applications, it will be present. So just be aware of that. Uh, now, sometimes there's an electrician coming in after the fact, Again, did somebody make connection to it? Was the timing done right for me able to get that connection of that four gauge copper down to the actual concrete case electrode? Again, all a timing thing that you have to be aware of. So as you see here, this was used uh, all the way back in the early 40s and the US Army used it uh, in climates like out in Arizona where it was very dry. Uh, this concrete has ability to retain a lot of moisture and this concrete case electrode works in conjunction with the rebar. It's not just the rebar, it's the rebar in the concrete, which has the ability to retain moisture. Many people know that curing concrete takes quite a while to cure, typically 28 days for cure process, but it does retain moisture very well and it works in conjunction. So together, they are the electrode itself, not just the rebar. Okay, and as you see here in the graphic, uh, it has to be encased in at least two inches of concrete, Located horizontally within the portion of the, the concrete foundation or footing, in direct contact with the earth, or within a vertical foundation or structural component, in direct contact with the earth. So this way or this way, either way, it's fine. It's got to be 20 feet or more, half inch or larger, could be larger, uh, electrically conductive reinforced bars or bare copper for AWG or larger. So, um, I could put copper bare in it, but most people are going to utilize the fact that during the construction, they typically use the rebar. Now, tying these pieces together, typical tie wires, nothing special, no special clamps. Uh, the metal tie wires that you typically would use to tie the rebar together is all that's necessary to do that. So like I said in the beginning, I could literally have 20 one-foot pieces overlapped and tied together. Okay, as long as I've got cumulatively 20 feet or more. Okay, and it is again half inch or larger size of a rebar. 250.52A4 ground rings. It has to encircle the entire building. It can't stop. It's got to go all the way around it. Uh, it has to be in direct contact with the earth. It has to consist in that encircling component. It has to at least be 20 feet of bare copper, not smaller than a two gauge. Could it be larger? Absolutely. Could an engineer make it too odd if they wanted? 
Absolutely. But again, I like to tell people lightning and dissipation that goes to the earth typically is what's traveling on these ground electroconductors to complete that path. It doesn't know any different and tests have already been done to say, for example, ground rods. 250.66A doesn't have to be larger than a six gauge copper, four gauge aluminum. Of course, with aluminum, you can't terminate outside within 18 inches of the earth, but still you could use copper or aluminum. In this case right here, they're very specific that it's copper one because it's gonna be in the earth. And it, again, it has to encircle the building, has to be at least 20 feet, and it can't be smaller than two gauge to do so. And the burial depth on this, it has to be not less than two and a half feet under the soil, okay? Under the top surface of your soil, okay? So it has to have a depth of cover of at least two and a half feet over it, all right? So that's a ground ring. Uh, where do I see ground rings? Typically, uh, a lot of times I will see ground rings at tower applications. But of course, they usually will put plates and all these other things as well, uh, thinking maybe the more the better. But again, this is all that the, the code requires. 250.52A5, which is dealing with rod and pipe electrodes. Again, I could use a pipe or conduit, minimum three quarter. Uh, galvanized or equivalent uh, in the earth would be utilized as an electrode. More often than not, what we do is we drive ground rods. Uh, ground rods can be uh, copper. They can be zinc coated steel. They can be non-listed stainless steel. Um, so, I mean, there's different alternatives that the manufacturers will give you. Uh, you have what's called listed and you have non-listed ground rods, okay? So if I have a listed ground rod, it's permitted to be less than 5 eighths of an inch in diameter. Other than that, the minimum size for non-listed is 5 eighths of an inch. So again, a lot of debate came about when you have some of these listed ground rods that when they do the diameter, it's actually smaller than 5 8, and the code says it has to be 5 8, and people freak out. These are listed ground rods, so they've been evaluated. So if they end up having a diameter that's less than 5 8, yet they still got their listing, they're okay. Don't worry about it. Don't have to make it overcomplicated, okay? So again, we'll cover all this in our course. And if my picture is, is blocking any of the screen, I apologize. It's uh, again, we just kind of doing a quick overview of everything that's going on here. Okay. Now, incidentally, these ground, they have to be driven not less than eight feet in the earth. Uh, with ground rods, for example, if you hit solid rock, then you're able to, to then switch to a 45 degree angle. Again, must be driven. Uh, if you can't do it at that angle, then you're allowed to dig the trench and bury it and go from that direction as well. And so you have options, but you have to always start with an attempt to drive it, okay? Uh, it's also something where I see people will actually have where they're doing a home and they're backfilling. And so there's a big gap there between where the backfill is and that's where the panel's going and a meter and everything. So they stick the ground rod in the ground there and they say, well, I don't have to drive it. I'm going to stick it down. By the time they push the backfill against it, then it'll be okay. That's not going to work because it says it has to be driven. So the backfill goes against it, things will settle and it could not have total surface contact area. So when the code says it has to be driven, it has to be driven. So as an electrician, I would wait until the backfill is in place, everything's pushed against the final grade, then I would drive my ground rods. That's how I would do it. The other we talked about, 250.52A6, other listed electrodes. Uh, here you see some examples on the screen, um, and they typically are chemical rods, and you have some that go vertical straight down in the necessary length, and you have some that go down and go horizontal. Again, you buy these, um, they will have a nameplate on it, gives you instructions. Uh, you'll have to dig up so that these can actually be placed in the ground because it's all about the uniqueness of how they're put in the ground, okay? And they have to be accessible. So they'll have a cover on it because you will have to replenish them over time. Uh, and again, probably why I don't like them. Uh, I'm nothing against them. But again, I know people out of sight, out of mind. How many people when you sell a home later will know that you have to go back and do some kind of maintenance to this? Probably not. But as you can see in the picture, you have an access well, uh, you have what's called a basic tube, and it actually gets filled with actual chemicals. Uh, and again, as you see here, you'll get what's called electrolytic roots that come out of it. And this says, you know, it's buried in benzonite clay. And it's just a bunch of stuff that has to be done for this one. Can you use them? Absolutely. You can. Okay. I'm just not a big fan of them. Doesn't mean they don't work. It looks to me like it's probably got a lot of surface area, but again, 
it is an option. Um, now, the other reason behind this is when they say other listed electrodes, because we don't have to make an all-inclusive list. If somebody comes up with a, another type of listed electrode that's adequate, that it's already going to be encompassed inside of 25052A6. And that's a good thing. We don't want to have uh, the... Uh, we don't want to restrict the ability for a manufacturer to be creative and come up with new ideas and new concepts. But we don't want to always have to be changing the code all the time as well. So then we get to 250.52A7, those plates we were talking about. So again, I see this a lot. Again, it's cell towers as well. Not only that, but the uh, uh, ground rings as well. Uh, each plate electrode required to expose not less than two feet to the exterior soil. Okay. Now, some interpret this rule as permitting a 12-inch square plate. You need to check with your local jurisdiction because if it's 12-inch square, then it's one foot on one side, one foot on the other side, and some people want it to be two foot on one side altogether, just on one side. Again, again, literally speaking, it states that it has to two feet, so it can't be less than two feet square in contact with the soil. Check with your jurisdiction. Uh, I think most of the time when you buy these plates, you're going to buy these plates and they're already going to be adequate because the manufacturers understand the rules, right? Um, installing rules are in 250.53 A, B, E, and H tell you how to do it, how to install it. We'll cover that in our program. I'm just kind of giving you a little taste of what you'll, you'll learn in this program. And then, of course, 250.52A8, other local metal underground systems or structures. So include, included in this are things like existing piping systems, copper piping, uh, metal piping that's in contact with the earth, underground tanks, uh, underground metal well casings that are not effectively bonded to the metal water pipe. Okay, So they're not connected to the water pipe, but they're there. Then they might have the ability to be utilized as an electrode. Okay, it's all about the surface area. So we'll go into some extreme detail. Um, I usually don't see a lot of these on any site, especially not new construction, uh, where you're going to have an underground tanks uh, or piping systems, or uh, you do have the well casing, but it's usually so far away, it kind of makes it moot to even be a part of the grounding electrode system. Okay, so again, I probably would argue that it is not uh, a grounding electrode. Uh, but again, jurisdictions, well, you'll have to, you have to confirm with your jurisdictions what they expect. Now, there are certain things in the code that you cannot use as electrodes. Now, that does not mean that we don't bond to them inside of the building, most notably a gas line. If it's likely to become energized, and that, again, is a tricky term, if it's likely to come energized. Inside of a building, the only time that I think a gas line would be likely to come energized, if it's mutually joined at a piece of equipment that has both electric power there and gas lines running to it. Since they both come together at the same piece of equipment, is there a likelihood that they could be, energy could be placed onto the gas line? Yes. However, the code allows me to use equipment grounding conductor for bonding in that case. The equipment grounding conductor that's with the circuit that supplies the piece of equipment that also has the gas line to it. So again, we're talking electrodes. Don't confuse that with bonding that would take place inside of a building that falls under the bonding rules. We're talking about electrodes. Separate the two, okay? Keep them separated. Now, as far as an underground metal gas piping system, all right, that is not going to be utilized as an electrode. However, like it says here on the screen, the interior piping system may be required to be bonded in accordance with 250-104B, as I just talked about, again, if it's likely to become energized, okay? Uh, aluminum electrodes are not to be utilized as electrodes, okay? So, you, so your grounding electrodes cannot be aluminum. Uh, the structures and reinforcing steel, uh, reinforcing steel described in 680.26B1 and B2. So if you're not familiar with 680.26, what we're talking about is the steel that goes into your decking or into your swimming pool. Yes, it's rebar. Yes, it's in concrete. More often than not, it's probably gunite, but it's in contact with the earth. And you're thinking, as most people would think, it's like, wow, that seems like that would be just one nice big electrode. I, it might seem like that, but you can't use it, okay? So you can't use the swimming pool if you have one, if it's concrete with rebar in it, contact with the earth, 
That's a total different issue up in 680.26 for equipotential bonding. It is not to be utilized as an electrode, okay? Might look like a pretty one, but you're not gonna use it, okay? And we'll cover all that in the course. Uh, 250.53, grounding electrode system installation. Again, ground, uh, it's in 53 section, gives us the parameters for installing rod, pipe, and plates. So you'll get all the rules that have to be met uh, in there, and it's 250.53A1 through A3. Uh, A1, for example, we talked a little bit about ground rods. We're practicable, okay, like where you can do it, these electrodes are to be embedded below the, um, the permanent moisture level. I would tend to think 99.9% .9 of the people in the country do not do this. They do not install it. They drive it to the ground and they stop. And in many places of the country, the actual permanent moisture level is below the ground, not at the surface of the ground. Okay. Again, your jurisdiction may not invoke this, may not bring this up, may not give you any grief. But you do need to know what the code is. And it says it has to be below the permanent moisture level. Now, and that's usually for many people is the water table and how deep the water table is in your area. Um, I think that, again, most inspectors are just going to make sure that it's driven. And that's it. Um, must be free from... Um, must be free from non-conductive coatings. So we can't have anything on this rod that's going to inhibit the connection between the fitting or the connector that goes on the rod and the grounding electroconductor that makes a connection to the rod. Okay, so if there's any of that that's there, must be removed. Uh, good news is most of the ground rods you buy anyway, whether they're copper clad or they're stainless steel or they're galvanized steel or whatever, are not really going to have anything that would, would be considered non-conductive coatings. So you really don't have a whole lot to worry about with that. Okay. But again, you buy them that way. Uh, now, the only exception to this rule uh, would be, for example, if I was using a rod and the rod was coated with something, then that would be pointless. You'd have to remove the coating, okay, in order to make that connection. But normal ground rods, buy them off the shelf, get them out of the supply house, you're perfectly fine. Um, now, this is where people get a little bit confused here when it, call, when it talks about a supplement electrode, because remember, we're still in single rod, pipe, and plate electrode applications. It says, a single rod, pipe, or plate electrode must be supplemented by an electrode of the type specified in 250.52A2 through A8. Now, the notice it doesn't say A1, which is the water pipe. Obviously, the water pipes, you have to be supplemented anyway on their own. But when it comes to the rod, pipe, or plates, they also have to be supplemented. Now, this used to be what people would say is, well, what about the 25 ohms or less rule? Well, that's the rule where if you meet that, you can have one rod or one pipe or one plate. But if you can't meet that or show me that, then you're going to have to have it supplemented with an additional one. Now, that doesn't mean I have to have two ground rods. I could have a ground rod in one of the others that are enlisted from A2 through A8. It just so happens that most people will put two ground rods. Makes it simple. Keep them six feet apart. Go for it. All right, so the supplemental electrodes is permitted to bond to one of the following. So what we're trying to say here is if I run it to a single ground rod and now I have to put a supplemental electrode, where do I connect? that supplemental electrode to. Now, most people are just going to connect it to the, the first ground rod. The supplemental one will connect to the first one. Sort of like that picture we saw earlier where the plate was connected to the ground rod. Okay. Now, since the rod, pipe, and plate all fall under the same heading, then their ability to utilize the same grinding electroconductor for those doesn't have to be larger when you go from a rod to the plate or a rod to a rod. It can be the same size that you're permitted to run to the rod. Okay. Don't overcomplicate it. So in this case, where can I make that supplementary connection? I can do it to the rod, and that's what most people do, the pipe or plate. I can also take that supplementary, not to the other rod or the other, I can take the supplementary electrode, the grounding electroconductor to the grounding electroconductor of the system, uh, or the one that supplies the other electrode, I can take it to that grounding electroconductor. I can take it to the grounded service entrance conductor, okay, inside of the service enclosure, if I want it. Typically, it'll go to the same common bus uh, as the grounded conductor anyway. I can also take it to a non-flexible grounded service raceway. 
So because of all the requirements for the bonding of raceways, if it's a metal raceway and it's a non-flexible, so it's like an EMT or rigid or IMC intermediate, and it's on has service conductors in it, then we have to do something called additional insured bonding that we follow in the National Electrical Code, most notably 250.90 and 92. So when we do this, we can be assured that that raceway is connected to the grounded conductor, probably in the meter, everything's bonded together. So at a location where I could take it and make a connection to it. Now you gotta use the right clamp and make the proper fittings to it, but, and follow everything in 250.8, which is the termination requirements uh, for grounding and bonding applications. But if you do that, then you can connect to a non-flexible grounded service raceway, perfectly fine. And that would typically be what's coming up out of the ground and going into the meter, for example, okay? And of course, the last one, any grounded service enclosure. So again, there's service enclosures, so it probably has a main service disconnect. So I, actually the supplemental could actually connect to a, the service enclosure as well. Because you got to remember in a service closure, you're going to have a main bonding jumper. It's all going to be tied together anyway. So this is okay. Not a problem. So I have some alternatives here to, to be able to make these connections. Um, there's the exception. So 250.53A2 says, well, do I always have to have a supplement for the ground rod, the plate, and the pipe electrode? Well, it says if the resistance of a single rod pipe or plate is 25 ohms or less, a supplemental grounding electrode is not required. So many years ago, we put one in, and if you couldn't show that it was 25 ohms or less, you put two. Now, in the last couple of cycles, we've shifted. We said, no, nope, you're going to supplement it always and start off with two unless you can show me that it's 25 ohms or less. And if you can prove that to me, then I'll let you go back down to one. Okay. But again, you'll find that some of the ground resistance testers that you need to use, because you can't use a regular ohm meter, you can't use a regular volt meter, you, you have to have special equipment, three point, three point fall of potential meter or a clamp on um, meter that's designed to actually detect the ground resistance. And if that's the case and you show 25 ohms or less, then you can just reduce it down to one if you want. I think by the time you spend all that money, it's probably easier to just drive another ground rod, make sure it's six feet away and save yourself a little money. But they are out there if you wanna do that. If you wanna make it your mission to <laughs> only have to install single ground rods, then, then go for it. Um, so the resistance of a ground rod, as you can see here, um, so we have a bunch of different options, you know, here. These is, you know, notice these says no resistor requirement for all of these type of electrodes. The resistance requirement, 25 ohms or less, only applies to rods, pipes, and plates. That's it. Anywhere else, the actual resistance could be a thousand ohms and it doesn't require any supplement. Plates, rods, and pipes, Thresholds 25 ohms or less in order to be able to get rid of the supplement, okay? And again, doing all this is requires testing equipment, earth resistant testers. This right here is a three point fall of potential and you have to have enough space on the property to do this because it's all about the spacing. Um, and again, you'll connect everything together and you'll, it just gets more complicated, but you can do it. You just have to follow the instructions. The three point fall ones are, um, not overly expensive. Now the clamp on one ground resistance meter, that one is expensive. I'm talking 1200, 1500 bucks at last I checked. These you can probably get for three, four, $500. But again, I can have my helper drive a lot of ground rods with my hammer drill than to do this. But again, if you need to do it, there you go. Um, now multiple rods and uh, splices spacing. Let's talk about that. 250, 53, A3 for multiple rods, pipes, and plates. Space not less than six feet apart. Now, the IEEE recommends that they be at least the length of the rod apart. So if they're eight foot rods, they'd like them to be eight feet apart because of the sphere of influence and what happens um, in cancellation effects that takes place if this sphere overlaps. So if you keep them six feet apart, it's, the theory is it's not gonna overlap. Um, but again, most of the IEEE folks and the engineers want to use eight foot rods, they want you to be eight foot apart. That way ensures that there's no overlap. Uh, but again, six feet's all that's in the National Electrical Code. And again, if the one doesn't meet 25 ohms or less, 
Got to go with the second one. Uh, what's interesting I like to show in this graphic here is this showing one connector and it goes unbroken through to the next rod. Uh, this is your grounding electroconductor to the first one. This is a bonding jumper to the second one. It does not have to remain unbroken. It does have to remain unbroken to the first electrode. But from here to here, it is simply a bonding jumper of the same size as what you supplied to the ground rod. It's just that you would have to have two separate clamps here. One for the first one, then you put another clamp, and then you would feed the second one. But if you want to save yourself a clamp, then just loop it through and make sure that your grounding electroconductor is long enough to sufficiently handle the six-foot spacing, and you're good to go. If you want to do that, go for it. Uh, the number of ground rods in parallel, there's a formula for this, uh, and uh, you can work that out on your own. We do cover it uh, in the book, uh, but I'm not going to do that for this episode. Again, here's your multiplier. You simply plug in your multiplier uh, where you need to. And again, N is the number of rods. F is the factor. That's the factor from this table, depending on the rod you have, two rods. Okay. And then you have the R, which is resistance of a single uh, grounding electrode. And then RT will be the combined total resistance of the electrode system, okay? Where an engineer might describe it or design it, we actually will cover this in our presentation or in the course itself. So um, the note, uh, the paralleling efficiency of ground rods is increased by spacing them twice the length of the, lo uh, the longest rod, okay? It's informational note, so it's just making a suggestion. Remember I told you the IEEE engineers believe that you should have at least eight foot ground rod, they should be eight foot apart. But here they believe the recommendation, or at least in the informational note, it says that when your paralleling efficiency of ground rods is increased, means it's more efficient by spacing them twice the length of the longest rod. So if the longest rod is eight feet, twice the length of that would be 16 feet, that they would like it to be 16 feet apart. The reason this is an informational note, because not a lot of times on a property do we have the luxury of being that far apart with our electrodes. Of course, it also does mean that the grounding electroconductor and subsequent bonding jumper, if that's what you use, uh, has to be a lot longer and it's susceptible to more damage. So we have to be very careful because there's no code requirement that says that it has to be buried, the, the grounding electroconductor. So again, when it's exposed, it is more prone to potential damage. So we have to keep those things in mind, okay? Uh, current through ground rods at various system voltages. As you can see here, uh, if I had 120, now this is interesting because it kind of gives you an understanding of how the grounding electrodes cannot clear overcurrent devices for at least on our side of the system. Now, utility side, it's beneficial because usually they don't have a very big fuse out there. But on our side, it's a little different, okay? So for example, 240 volt application, Resistance of a ground rod is 25 ohms, then it's 9.6 amperes. Not going to trip a 15 amp breaker. Heaven forbid it's a 20 amp circuit, it's not going to trip a 20 amp circuit. Um, again, the 120 and 25 ohm ground rod, and again, in a perfect world, we see this out at poles in parking lots all the time where the engineers specify ground rods. And then many people think you're not required to take an equipment grounding conductor to that pole. You absolutely are, because that's the low impedance effective ground fault current path it's going to trip a breaker, okay? The connection to earth through ground rods is not going to trip a breaker. And you can see the math right here. It's pretty simple. At 120 volts, at 25 ohms, a perfect world, it's only going to have 4.8 amps. That is never going to trip a breaker. In fact, I think it's quite interesting that even on a 20 amp circuit, you'd go up to as high as 480 volts on a perfect resistance to ground rod at 25 ohms still only can produce 19.2 amps. It would not trip a typical 20 amp overcurrent device. It's amazing. But when you get to the utility side where they're running 7,200 and they drive ground rods all the time out there at their poles for the utility on the primary side, then you can see that it's easily going to blow fuses on their primary because at 7,200 at 25 ohm rod, 288 Amps is easily going to bl blow those those four and six amp fuses that they utilize on the primary side very quickly. So it's okay for them. But in the voltages that me and you use, it's not going to work. It's just not going to happen. The resistance is just not going to allow it to happen. So the resistance is way too high through the earth. Now again, for utility people, 
beautiful thing for them. For us, it's not going to work. It becomes a safety concern. So never think that a ground rod can take the place of an equipment grounding conductor. It cannot at all. Don't ever fall for that. Okay. So when we talked about the ground, the dry, um, ground rods, remember what I said about them? It says it has to be at least eight foot in contact with the soil. So you see here, it's driven. All right. And if that doesn't work, 45. Okay. If it hits rock's bottom, then I'm allowed to bury it into it. Uh, it has to be below two and a half feet of cover. Now, if I have to supplement this ground rod, which I would, if it's just the ground rod, then I have two of them. Well, if they're straight up and down like this, then the code says it only has to be six feet from the next one. Okay. And this one right here, if it's at a 45 and I have an additional one, it just has to be within uh, at least six feet from the, the closest point. Okay. So in this case, if this was six feet apart, we would measure from here to here. We wouldn't measure from here to here. All right. Now, if I had to put them in the ground because I could not get them driven, then I can lay them in on the third option. And if I do two of them, I would go two and a half feet down, but they would also, the end to end, that would have to be at least six feet apart. So if I have an eight foot and an eight foot, that's 16, and then I have to have them six feet apart, okay? So it's 16 feet of total ground rod length plus an additional six feet that I have to keep them separated, okay? Still have to meet the rules, okay? So again, so you see, we'll cover all this in this unit. Uh, and again, clamps, clamps, uh, listed clamps are required must be suitable for the conductor and the rod or pipe that it's being used on. What you see here is an acorn clamp, okay? And this is a saddle clamp, okay? Um, listed for direct burial, okay? They'll have a listing on them that says they're listed for direct burial. They'll have on there DB for direct burial, okay? And if it's marked DB, it's also suitable for concrete encasement, okay? Based on their listing, all right? So, Rod and pipe clamps identified for direct barrel are also suitable for concrete encasement, like I just said, and that'll all be stamped on there, usually DB, and do that, okay? This is typically ground rod, and this is also a ground rod as well. And you see the little teeth that bite and, and connect onto the ground rod. Now, sometimes you'll see these that are both a water pipe clamp and a ground rod clamp, and they'll have two little little nipples that come off of this end. And that means you take that and you would turn it around and those little nipples would push against the ground rod. Okay, so you have a ground rod would be on this side in here. You take this, slide it off, turn it around and it has two little points that will nestle around the ground rod. Okay, but the way it's shown right here, this is a water pipe clamp right here. Okay, but it might, it's also a rod clamp because it is good for a pipe. So it would be good for a rod as well. Uh, your plates, as you see here, they can't be less than 30 inches below the surface. And of course, we have two feet of coverage, the two and a half feet minimum of surface area in contact with the earth. I would argue that if it's one foot by one foot, then again, I've, I've got enough coverage. Everything is, is perfectly fine for me. And I feel that I could utilize either side to achieve that. Okay. Or I can use them together to achieve that. It's insert contact with the surface on both sides, okay? So again, code requires that it what? Has a minimum of two and a half feet, okay? Or excuse me, a minimum of two feet of surface area, but it has to be in the ground a minimum of two and a half feet or 30 inches, which equals the same. Uh, 250.53B, electrode spacing. As you can see here, if more than one rod, pipe, or plate is used, the electrodes have to be not less than six feet apart. So there you go. Now, this is also interesting because I've had other electrodes that say are there for a lightning system and I have electrodes for that. Then they would also, the electrodes would have to be at least six feet apart if I'm using two separate electrodes, okay? Now, notice this little statement here. So this is the grounding electrode system for the structure. And this is this airstrike system here. So the space of the grounding electrodes of different systems at least six feet apart or you bond them together, okay? You have options, okay? Most of the time, I utilize one set of electrodes and I bond all of my systems together to utilize those same electrodes. I can do that as well. Uh, 250.53C, bonding jumpers. Bonding jumper is used to connect grounding electrodes together. You heard me talk about that earlier, whether it's from a rod to a rod, as we see here rod to a rod, okay? We're using a bonding jumper. 
Uh, you install bonding jumpers in accordance with 250.64 A, B, and E, and we'll cover all that in our course. You size these bonding jumpers the same way you size the grounding electroconductor in accordance with 250.66, okay? And, and so, again, you're not going to use the rebar. We've already discussed that you can't use that to tie electrodes together. That was not permitted in 250.68. So what are we going to do here? We're going to have bonding jumpers that connect everything together. And as you see here, this might be the grounding electroconductor. This is size 250.66, the table. Okay, because it is not one of the ones that are listed in 250.66 A, B, or C, which are some kind of exceptions to the rule for rod, pipe, and plates, for a concrete and case electrode and ground rings, any other electrode, you're simply going to pull from the table, okay, and size accordingly. So this is in-ground steel, and here, there, this would be considered a bonding jumper. Uh, and let's say I'm jumping over to the water pipe ground. This would be a bonding jumper. Size 250.66. So what we're doing here is just showing you a bunch of bonding jumpers that are tying. Here's the ring. It's being connected. Once established that it's in ground is electrode, the steel, then you can connect to it. And here you are jumping over to the ground ring. And we're tying everything together. Okay, here's your water pipe. Within the five foot of entry, we're tying it here over as well. So you have tons of options that you can do. Um, and... We're going to cover all of those in this program. So sizing the grounding, uh, the electrode bonding jumpers, as I kind of said, if it is structural framing or building to metals in ground supports, then the minimum size bonding jumper would be 2 ot AWG copper, okay, table 250.66. Uh, and so anyway, rather than go into all these, you will see that, again, these all correspond with all these callouts. Um, in the program, we will literally walk you through every sizing uh, requirement all the way down uh, to the actual end result, and we'll cover all of that. Continuity. If you come into the case where you have an underground water pipe ground and, there's, and you come in five foot of entry and you're going to use this to interconnect other electrodes, what happens if it has a meter there that can affect any connection that's on the load side of, let's say, a water meter? Then we have to bond over the water meter right here. Okay. If this is removable, then I have to bond over it in order to maintain the integrity of this connection. Why? Because we're making a connection here to the grounding electrode downstream. We're connecting to this part of the electrode, and this part that comes in that's five feet can be utilized as that connection point. We're not going to come out here and connect it. We're going to utilize that five foot of point of entry to make sure we make that connection. Okay, so if we got a meter that can be removed that could infect the integrity of this connection, then we're going to have to put a jumper on it. Okay, so we cover all those, and of course, we have to supplement a water pipe ground. Okay, so metal water pipe, underground water pipe system is required to be supplemented by another electrode specified in 250, 52A2 through A8. So we can supplement it with, can't use another water pipe, that would be foolish, but we could use rods. Pipes, plates, we could use rings, we could use other electrodes, we could use in-ground metal systems. We have a plethora of options. We just can't use another water ground, water pipe ground to, to be the supplemental for the water pipe. Uh, most people in this case, when they do water pipe ground, they're just going to supplement it with ground rods. Here's something to remember. A lot of people think that, well, that means that if I have a water pipe ground, I just run one ground rod because it's supplementing. No. If you add a ground rod to be the supplemental for the water pipe, it has to maintain the integrity if the water pipe is ever discontinued or there's a repair to it or somebody changes it to PVC. That's a whole intent while we're doing this. So you have to make sure that the rods that you're installing or that system can stand in its own merits. So that means if it's ground rods, it still has to apply 25 ohms or less. So what it means is you, if you're going to use rods, you might have a underground water pipe connection and you would have two ground rods. Makes sense? If you lost the water pipe, you have to maintain the integrity. And that's why you would have to meet all the rules for rod, pipe, and plates. And they were the only ones, if you remember, that had the 25 ohm rule under 250-53A. Now, if you use any of the other electrodes, then that can be the supplement, and you don't have to, ha don't have to worry about the 25 ohm rule. That only applies to rod, pipes, and plates. So just remember that. Even if it supplements a water pipe, and it is a rod, pipe, or plate, it still has to meet the 25 ohms or less rule 
or you got to have at least two to be able to be sufficient, okay? And again, where do you connect this supplemental? We talked about earlier. You can take it to the grounding electroconductor, the, the general one that's being run to the actual ground rods, I mean, to the water pipe ground. You can make a connection directly to that because that was your primary grounding electrode conductor. Um, you can connect it to the grounded service conductor inside of the service enclosure, a non-flexible service raceway like IMC, RMC, EMT, if you will. Uh, I can actually take it to the grounded service enclosure as well, okay? So I have rules and allowances, and of course, we cover this in our course. Uh, and again, here's an example. So here is the water pipe ground, and this installation chose to supplement it with ground rods. This is probably the easiest way to do it. So in this case right here, the supplement electrodes are ground rods. They have to meet the 25 ohms or less. Here is your water pipe ground, and this is the five-foot point of entry. Now, notice this. It says violation. Bonding conductor must supplement electrode must be connected to grounding electrode conductor. That's this. Grounded service entrance conductor. Okay, not shown. Non-flexible grounded service raceway. Not shown. Any grounded service enclosure. Not shown. So see here, you see these ground rods and the supplemental is connected to the water pipe. Not going to work. You're given a list of where you can make these connections. Again, preferably, I'm going to take this clamp, take this wire, and I'm going to come up here and I'm going to connect it to the grounding electroconductor because that's going to be the, the, less, uh, the most benign way to affect my installation at this point because I'm already done. And I just want to make this connection and I want to move on. Okay, so I would come up here and make the connection to the grounding electroconductor because it allows me to do that right here, okay? So there you go for that. Um, 250.53D2 exception, the supplemental electrode is permitted to be bonded to the interior metal water piping at a convenient point as covered in 250.68C1. So in this application, again, I am permitted to bond it to the interior metal water piping if I meet the rules in 250.68C1 exception, then I'm going to make that, that exception to that rule and I'm going to have the ability to do that. Um, so anyway, this was supposed to be just a teaser. I went a little longer. I think I went almost an hour into this, okay? But what I wanted to do is basically just give you an overview of my grounding and bonding course and everything that we're going to talk about. And again, I was only probably about halfway through those slides. So the course itself has many more graphics, many more pages, many more in-depth applications to touch on in our grounding and bonding course. As you can see, when you go through all the units in our grounding and bonding course, you're gonna get this extensive knowledge of grounding and bonding that is really gonna help you in your career and the ability to look at something and just say, you know what? Grounding and bonding is not nearly as complicated as I thought it was. So hopefully you got something out of that. Again, my name is Paul Abernathy. Thanks for watching. And if you want more information on our courses, make sure you jump over to masterthenec.com.net or .org, any choice, what a flavor you want, or electricalcodeacademy.com.net or .org and look under the courses tab and you'll see our 2020 edition of our grounding and bonding course. So until next time, folks, stay safe and God bless. Shut up and sit down.